Quando você ouve um podcast, está procurando entretenimento ou conhecimento, certo? E se você procura por desempenho e qualidade para o seu veículo, qual a sua escolha? Os amortecedores Motorcraft têm tecnologia Ford e oferecem uma condução suave para uma viagem tranquila e segura. Escolha a confiabilidade dos amortecedores Motorcraft, válidos para a linha K, Fiesta, EcoSport e muito mais. Quando terminar seu podcast, é só acessar a loja da Ford no Mercado Livre e experimentar a diferença. Quer desenvolver os talentos da sua equipe e potencializar os resultados da sua empresa? Conte com a expertise do atendimento corporativo do Senac São Paulo, que já capacitou mais de um milhão de pessoas e profissionais de instituições públicas, privadas e terceiro setor. Construa uma equipe altamente motivada e capacitada e destaque-se no mercado. Entre em contato, acesse sp.senac.br barra corporativo e saiba mais. Quer saber? Senac. What's up, y'all? This is Zach with Living Corporate. And if you didn't know, Living Corporate is an experiences management company, y'all. What does that mean? That means we help organizations support their go-to-market strategy through building market trust, as well as their employee engagement strategy by building employee trust. And how do we do that? Well, we have data analytics and organizational assessments. We have our e-learning platform, and we have our media capabilities, our brand storytelling capabilities. What you're about to listen to is an incredible conversation we had with the executive leader at Cap Gemini. Cap Gemini is a global consulting firm shaping the entire world, organizational transformation, digital transformation, technical implementations, you name it, Cap Gemini does it. So excited and thankful for this campaign. Shout out to Janet Pope. Shout out to the executive leadership team. I'm excited for you to get into this discussion. Here we go. <laughs> Nick, what's going on, man? How you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. It's, look, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you know, this is part of our larger Cap Gemini campaign. We're spotlighting different leaders, really like days in the life of um, of their executive leaders. I guess I'm. I'd love to understand what brought you to to Cap Gemini and what's keeping you at Cap Gemini. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, really did bring me to Cap Gemini is the idea of being able to be part of a global organization uh, where we have a wide multitude of clients ranging from you know any sector uh, to any other industry uh, from a given day. But more importantly, Cap Gemini also has their own um, end-to-end capabilities, is what we call it, uh, specifically because I work in the automotive sector a lot. We actually have the capabilities within our own company to start from an ideation uh, for a for a vehicle all the way to actually creating that vehicle and building that out, and that's evidenced by some of our um, you know early autonomous vehicle demo um, that we have out there. Um, and so you know we can do a, for instance at CES we do a live remote demo uh, where we could control or view uh, an AV vehicle that's driving around in France, for instance. <laughs> Wow, that's incredible. I mean, going like you went straight into it. So you're talking again, like it's the global, uh, the the global context as well as I like, really like the interconnectivity of the work that you do to really like connect around the world. That's dope. That is. Let me ask this. Yeah. <laughs> let me ask this though. Like, what when you think about your role, mm-hmm. right? Like, it. What I'm hearing is a lot of. It sounds like there's like a there's an element of a like Internet of Things happening there. Like. What does that look like? And and what is like for the layman's who maybe have never heard of Internet of Things or like global connectivity, like what does that really mean? And what is your role entail in, in driving that strategy forward? Well, what it really comes down to is really about pushing that edge of technology into the future. Right. We're running into a situation uh, where, you know, specifically in a lot of uh, sectors, there's not a lot of innovation and not a lot of development because we're running to a point where. We're, we're sort of outpacing almost uh, computer um, technology, right? And this is where we're coming down to Internet of Things, edge computing, and a lot of talk about AI and quantum computing as the future. What's going on is that when we talk about all these devices that have uh, really cool things that are being enabled, um, but what we need is actually a little bit more processing power 
and the ability to future proof it right because if you're going to spend x amount of money on the new next gen quote unquote next gen device today you still want to be able to use that device three four five years from now in the future versus you know constantly having to upgrade something right uh and, and i think that's sort of you know the, the the way that we're going moving forward especially as we touch both on innovation and sustainability a lot of components within like electronics and technology is isn't really recyclable as a whole right so what we want to do is extend that lifespan and what's going on is that when we think about internet of things right we're being able to really create um you know new software around it get updates over the air and make it feel fresh again right next gen and have that computing processing power to be able to handle you know all that data that's being inputted for the next five years and and that really does stretch out that longevity of a device and for the consumer it makes me feel like i've had a good quote-unquote investment right if i'm spending let's say a thousand dollars on something and if i use it for two years and have to you know flip it for the next version that's about a five hundred dollar a year investment just to use that device. But if I can stretch that out to five years or 10 years, that makes that value so much more. And for me to be able to invest into something, you know, as a consumer, I'm much more happy to do that versus I know that something is gonna be obsolete in a year. I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm gonna always be chasing that next version. I'll wait till the next one comes out. I'll wait till the next one comes out. Yeah. But you're never gonna get that next one what you need is today, you know, some technology that really makes your life better today. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, to that end, right. Of like this, like constant, um, this cycle. Right. And I think like the, I think like the tech, the tech and the debt, the tech dev cycle is like accelerating at like an exponential clip now. Like, I guess I'm curious to you about curious when it comes to like engaging your clients and managing their expectations as well as what their strategy is of like, what does it look like? So they say, hey, look, sustainable enhancement over time at this, like, where does the, like, where, like, it's, it feels like there's this balance between customer demand, mm -hmm. client, like, rather, like, market demand and, like, you know, client or organizational capability. And it feels like they just have to find this, this sweet spot because, to your point, like, it's almost like there's, like, this just, I mean, of course, we know there's like continual improvement and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'm not saying that you ever stop per se, but I could see there being fatigue like for your clients and for the markets they serve. So what does it look like to manage that so that either side isn't getting burnt out? Yeah, I think that also alludes to the earlier question where you said, what keeps me here? Right. And I think this is the yeah. fun of this is that we get to work hand in hand with our clients um, and really work on their innovation cycle. But just as you said, really be very customer focused, giving them the innovations that they want, but also being very, very value driven. We need to make sure that both the customer and the company, our client, is realizing that actual value. And sometimes it has to come down to when we're talking about IoT and OTA, and edge computing and AI, well, what we really are talking about is digital products and services innovation, right? Things that we can create out of software, I can push it to your device, you know, and then you're willing to pay for that as a consumer to refresh that device and get new capabilities out of it. We're not taking away, you know, the core functions of what that device is. Mm. What we're doing is layering and adding on top to it. And for a small payment, Right, whether it be a subscription model or a one-time fee or whatever that business model makes sense, they're gonna get mm -hmm. all this new functionality, and then all of a sudden, they're they're excited about that device that they bought two three years ago, today, and then I think that's kind of the key here is that when we work with our clients, you know, a lot of them are like, oh, if you think about hardware innovation cycles, right? You think about the complexities of. You know, we just came out of, you know, 2020, 2021, when supply chain was a huge problem. We've resolved a lot of that, but we need to prepare for the future, for the next time that there's a supply chain disruption, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, we're not constantly having to reinvent the process of manufacturing, yeah. changing the tooling, you know, changing all the production lines. 
when something could have that, you know, uh, OTA update, and then everyone is happier, everyone makes a little bit more money out of that same product, right, which is the client mm -hmm. ask, but the customer ask is, I want something more out of this that I think, think was possible when I bought it, you know, two, three years ago. And that's something that's really uh, happening around consumer products, you know, specifically, and then also in the automotive space, which is, you know, something that we've kind of relegated to be an antiquated kind of industry, right? The manufacturing lines yeah. or manufacturing lines, you know, there's something that, you know, automotive manufacturers are really great at is making a lot of cars really quickly. But the problem is that to change that process is really long. And if we think about IOT, putting that into a vehicle and then being able to do updates and then making that vehicle feel fresh again, you're no longer stuck yeah. on a two, three year, I'm going to trade that car in kind of idea. You're going to keep that car for five, six years, maybe even longer, you know, and think about, you know, the, the infinite possibilities around that, because really when we're talking about a lot of things today, sustainability is really the key here. And, and why throw away or recycle something or sell, you know, something that hasn't really reached the end of its life. What, what we're looking for yeah. is a little bit of freshness, right? You know, we've done this mm -hmm. for computers. We've done this for, you know, our mobile phones, right? We download a new update, new operating system, and it feels fresh again. And now I can, you know, play the latest games. Now, albeit it might be a little bit slower, but we're being able to do, you know, all this new innovation and, and, and realize today's technology, even though it's a couple of years old. Yeah, that's really exciting. And so, like, what I'm hearing is, to your point about similar to, like, really, I mean, I think our phone is, like, the most tangible example. So, when there's this, there's this management of, like, there's a customer experience play here of, like, okay, look, from a CX perspective, I genuinely like the hardware of my phone. Mm -hmm. But I also would like to be able to take photos at a higher grade, or I'd like to open up multiple apps and, like, multi-stream or i'd like to be able to sign a contract with my you know blah 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 blah. like let's, let's just name out the features that you have i don't really care and, and 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 hey i might be a little frugal i like i might like my my older phone but i still want these capabilities mm -hmm. i think the idea of like continuing that forward across like different platforms is very interesting and i agree from a sustainability perspective that just makes more sense the reality for me somebody like like myself nick I haven't bought a new car since 2013, Oh, 14. okay. So, right? And so, and I'm probably not going to. I'm probably going to just continue to ride that we have our family vehicle. But in my, my car, you know what I'm saying? Now, so this is not an ad, so I'm not going to say the company. But, you know, it's a good car. It's a nice size. It works fine. And the reality is I don't drive it that much. So, mm -hmm. to your point about, like, hey, has this product really reached the end of its life cycle? No. Don't even have 100,000 miles on it. So, right. what am I doing? Right? Well, um, when we think about, yeah. you know, things like that. It really does come back to, you know, when we're talking about IoT and, and the ecosystem of partners, right? That car that mm. you have today is, is still perfectly fine, gets you from point A to point B, but your menus may not have everything that you want. It may not be streaming the latest videos and music, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're thinking about here is that, you know, as we move into the future vehicle, right, where vehicles are going to become more software defined and, and more prevalent to that OTA, well, it's going to reach out to that ecosystem where your car would now connect to your home, connect to your phone, connect to, you know, things that we haven't even thought about connecting to and really creating that immersive environment. Because when we're talking about, you know, customer centricity here, right, most customers mm -hmm are not, I hate to say this, they're not tech junkies like you and I are and, and, and the subset sure. of the, you know, the world here. None of us, you know, most consumers are not comparing RAM modules, how quickly, you know, is processing data, none of that. They're looking for real world yeah. experiences and how it can change my life. And sometimes it's like, hey, I got this new update and then I was able to download this new app that connected to, for, you know, spitballing here, a washing machine at my home. You know, and yeah. all of a sudden is realizing that, 
you know, the, the energy demands are, are low right now and it's going to save me money if it runs the washing machine three hours from now versus whatever, but it's sensing where yeah. I'm driving right now and it knows that I'm almost my way home. It's going to time it so that the washing machine's done by the time I come home because I'm going to walk right by it and I can move it right into the dryer. Yeah. At no point did we talk about processing speeds and, and how what kind right. of chip is in there. Is there a GPU, CPU, any of that stuff? You know, what we were talking about here is what does it mean to a consumer? We can talk about advancements from the, you know, from the tech cycle, how quickly mm -hmm. we can, you know, iterate silicon and, and quantum computing and, and, and more processing power. But to a consumer, it doesn't matter, right? What does it mean for their day-to-day -day life? And sometimes when we talk to our tech clients, we have to bring them back and say like, hey, you can do it, but should you, right? Is someone going to mm -hmm. pay you? X amount of money more for that versus what they bought two years ago from you. Right. And then sometimes, yeah. I, you know, we got to think about that. Hey friends, you know what I don't miss at all? That vicious week before the period feeling like I'm ready to crawl out of my skin, irritated by everything and everyone around me, bouncing between cravings for salty foods and sweets and back again. Now it's easier to manage PMS with Estro Control from Happy Mama. Estro Control contains science-backed herbal extracts called adaptogens. Now here's the beauty about adaptogens. They help the body adapt to any stressors, like the chaotic hormonal changes that happen naturally throughout a menstruating person's life. And the biggest benefit? Feeling like myself again. That's what people mention over and over in their reviews. And there are over 17,000 reviews for Happy Mammoth products, including Estro Control. For a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use the code CORP, C-O-R-P, at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use the code C-O-R-P for 15% off today. Living Corporate is brought to you by Rosetta Stone, the most trusted language learning program. It's incredible. Okay, so first off, you didn't know, Rosetta Stone is a trusted expert for over 30 years with millions of users and 25 languages offered. They have fast language acquisition, meaning you're actually going to pick up the language because it's going to provide an immersive experience for you through their program. Speech recognition gives you a trainer for your accent. Convenient, right? You can use it on your computer. You can use it on your phone. Incredible value. Lifetime membership has all languages for any and all trips or language needs in life. That's lifetime access to 25 language courses Rosetta Stones offers for 50% off. That's a steal, y'all. So don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a limited time, living corporate listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. Visit rosettastone.com backslash today. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com backslash today, today. This podcast, Living Corporate, it's brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with the audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place on your terms. Let me tell you something. Y'all might not know this, but Living Corporate, we started our whole journey on Squarespace. My website, ZacharyNunn.com, it's on Squarespace. I can't tell you how much I appreciate its fluid engine, the ability to create world-class templates and design. It's very intuitive, incredible. We have custom merch, through our Squarespace, we have an incredible asset library, so I can always mix it up, switch and swap. It's super dope. And the fact that you can host all types of content, video, audio, all types of media, you can put all on your Squarespace. I can't recommend it enough. If you want to learn more about Squarespace, check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com backslash corporate to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that's squarespace.com backslash corporate to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. 
you know, it's interesting, like from a product, like even just from like a product perspective and just thinking about like from a, and thinking about customer experience, I think it's really easy for engineers and like even product managers to like get really excited about, oh, we, hey, this thing can do this thing now. And it's like, cool. Like how, like what is the, what is the quantifiable improvement or impact on like customer experience with this thing? Mm -hmm. Like you're saying that like you move this box from here to here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Like, what does that mean? And that's not to say that there isn't value in that, but if you can't really translate Mm -hmm. that to your point to like improving their actual practical experience, you're really not doing too much. And And I think to your point about from a consultative perspective, it's really important to be that, um, that translative partner uh, for your clients who are the, who oftentimes, especially depending on like the organization that might be more engineering led mm-hmm. versus products led. And so, you know, some, t- I, I would imagine you tell me if I'm right, right or wrong. I remember working at Capgemini, but I wasn't in that department. I would imagine there's probably like more engineering led consultancies out there that might have a smoother engagement mm-hmm. But the outcome is not as impactful as someone who has a more customer centric lens who has to kind of wrestle with and or uh, guide the client a bit more on like making sure that that narrative is CX centric. Correct. Am I right? And this is where, you know, it's interesting to be able to work at Capgemini because remember, Capgemini is actually one of the largest uh, engineering consulting firms in the world. And so we have an entire Mm -hmm. engineering uh, department. I don't want to say department, an engineering unit um, that is Mm -hmm. full of engineers that bring things to life, right? Um, But for a client, sometimes we need to start at that pointy end and go back to whether or not there is a business case for it. And that's the fun part about working at Capgemini is that I get to see all this new innovation, all the prototypes, all the things that are like cutting edge. You know, but what we also need to do is bring that back down to reality is just because I can make that, what is the practical use of it? And how do I make that, you know, into something that's packageable and being able to right. sell to a consumer and, and you know, to being end to end sometimes gives us that ability to almost look into the future. So clients will always say yeah. like, how did you know that? I was like, well, I can't really tell you, but it's already being developed what, what you're thinking of. Right. And we've already done it. And we can help you with that. But first, let's talk about this. And then we can help you get there. And that's the fun of this, right? Because we can accelerate really, really fast. It just comes down mm-hmm. to, you know, how, when, right? When should we bring it to market? Not necessarily how or why or, you know, all of that. I would imagine also, like, to your point earlier about, like, hey, we sh- like, you can do this, but should you do it? I would imagine there's also probably, like, some intersections with ethics there, too, right? So, like, there's different, we're seeing, like, automobile, um, or automobiles, automotions, automate, automotive co- organizations who they're like, hey, look, like we're going to we're going to unlock this feature mm-hmm. or we're going to manage this. Fe- but you have to you have to pay extra for that. Right. And it's like I could see there being a future world where like you're getting almost nickeled and dimed. Um, and so, like, there's this balance. Again, when you think about just overarching customer experience, it's like, OK, yep, we can make like a quick dollar right now mm-hmm. if we charged an extra x for them to use a colder version of their ac (laughs) or we could provide this and provide like longer lasting customer engagement and brand loyalty and maybe even like word of mouth you know footprint expansion in the market if we just create x y and z like is that something that you're seeing or are you seeing that like are you seeing that as a temptation yeah that's actually um that's actually been a previous project of ours is something that Mm. we've actually compiled here Uh, At Capgemini, one of the accelerators that we have is a digital services library specifically for many different industries, but one for automotive, right? And what we've done Mm -hmm. is to research into that to understand what clients, uh, customers are willing to pay and what they're not willing to pay for. And then we can kind of create that research around it, right? And then that helps us with the development process because if clients, if customers are not willing to pay for a certain, um, you know, digital service, What you need to do is to create, you know, models around how to drive that adoption and then push it out there in some sort of maybe a freemium process or, you know, maybe a free for X amount of time. And then you go into subscription process. There's many different ways to skin that. But what we really want to do is to make sure that there's a value being brought to it. Right. Because if we're talking about, 
you know, um, putting together, you know, maybe like you said, there's a feature that customers are used to in a car. And, you know, let's just say like, hey, heated steering wheels, right? I paid for the elect- the hardware on that, but now you're going to charge me to be able to, to binary, turn it on, turn it off. That doesn't seem like a good thing, right? Just like you said, nickel and dime. And, and that's something that we want to be able to help our clients understand is that we've done the research behind this. That may not make sense, but what may make sense is something else, something like possibly hey, you know, someone may pay extra to do, um, you know, instead of just the interior lights being white, they may pay extra to have a programming feature to do different color lights. Now, that mm. won't alienate your core base, but you may get... A nah, that's 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 dope. There. See, that's, that's like, that's like, that's obviously like a clear additional wrinkle right. to my experience, right? Like, okay, cool. I got my app. I can go in my app and change. I want yellow lights today or i want pink lights because whatever right that's mad different than like to your point like hey these are long-standing features that we've all come to just right because that, and, right? like, and that's the fun part of this is that we get to look at all the new innovations that are coming out and then we get to help our our clients understand what is the value to a customer how much can we make out of that right in terms of money and then what mm-hmm. what are the different models that we can do to maximize you know the return on the investment cuz again we're we're here to make money for the client the client needs when they put r&d dollars into something to build a new software package um, you know that needs to be realized in terms of real money now then we go backwards right and that starts at the very beginning is planning the product, right? Five years into the future is when we start planning the next generation of vehicles. And if we're going to start mm-hmm. thinking about, hey, for instance, here, color changing interior lights. Well, guess what? We need to put in color changing LEDs or whatever lighting technology is on the interior. And then we got to figure out how to how to monetize that. Right. But it does. There is a hardware component to it. And then that LED light needs to be able to communicate to the car, to the internet, back to home to, in order to get that OTA update. Now, if you think about that, that's a little bit more complex than just putting in LED lights. So, And, and that's five yeah. years in the future. So we do have to plan ahead for five years in the future. And that's just one feature that we're thinking about. Let's, let's you know, think about other features that could be possible, right? Enabling um, different media options uh, on a center stack, customizing that. Well, all of that is enabled via you know the the communications protocols of that all but firstly it needs to be connected and and i think that's the key here is that as things are getting more and more connected we're just barely understanding what can happen when things start talking to each other right uh we we try to iot like there's the, the internet meme like internet all the things right and there's things that shouldn't need to be interneted, but it is internet. Right. Well, we joke right. about it now, but let's say in a couple of years from now, it starts to make sense, right? I think a couple of years mm. ago, we talked about, um, you know, the folly of putting a connected coffee maker. Well, guess I what? remember that. I remember those right. conversations. Like, yeah. guess what? Now today with wearables, right? It, it, it can know when I'm going to wake up. It actually predicts yeah. when I'm going to wake up. You know, yeah. and then because of that, I can get a fresh cup of coffee that is made based on my personal wake up time. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, right? I think it's amazing, too. I know I agree. And I think, you know, to this point about just going back to like experience, I would be remiss not to ask about two things. The first off, I want to talk about accessibility. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to try not to layer this question too, too heavy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when we think about a lot of these like conveniences, I think it's really easy to be like for like the layman's to kind of roll their eyes and be like, why can't you just get up and make your own coffee? Like what's what about blah, blah, blah. like, you know, it's just a lot of like, I won't say pessimism, but it's a bit of dismissiveness of like how valuable really is all of that. At the same time, though, I like I I'm curious in the work that you've done, a lot of things that you're describing are incredibly valuable. First of all, they're valuable, period, because it's helping you just create a better experience and convenience is a is really i think people continue to underestimate how how much people will pay and appreciate convenience in all things Mm -hmm. but but beyond like the convenience argument or angle 
there's also like an accessibility piece there, right? Like if if my tools and things around me are able to work for me against like my my own needs or my routines, and I might be someone with a with a visible or invisible disability, um, that can help make my just experience, my customer experience, but also really like my life experience that much more rich. I'm curious in the work that you lead at Capgemini, like where does the intersection of like lived experience or um, uh, disability, like where does that lens come into play and where is that applied? Well, accessibility is very important, right? When we think about technology, technology is about enabling something for everyone, right? Whether that be a mm -hmm. convenience factor or some type of help for something, you know, think about uh, some of the latest advancements, uh, for instance, in door locks, right? Mm. Uh, a lot of people don't think about it, but keys are really hard for people who have mobility challenges, right? Whether it be standing mm. up to reach a door handle, uh, if they're in a wheelchair, or the dexterity in a finger to do that. Well, what we've kind of helped with is created this new generation of locks that are Wi-Fi enabled, that are, you know, connected to your phone, it's interneted, right? And when you walk up to it, it senses all of that, and then it unlocks. Yeah. And if we can get a little bit further, it could we could also attach a, a arm to the door and have it open for you, right? But that is all mm -hmm. enabled by the foundations of the technology of being able to connect things and have them talk to each other. And that's really the key here, right? Because as I talked about, you know, we joked about that coffee maker, right? But most coffee makers are pretty small, right? So think about that if, in terms of like having someone being able to hit the buttons on a coffee maker or reach over the counter, you know, to do that. Well, if I can do that via my phone or if it's smart enough, and I'm not even talking about AI, right? Before, I'm right. talking about just machine learning, right? Just understanding my mm -hmm. schedule and thinking about that and being able to program that, well, that changes a lot of things here. I no longer have to like hit the buttons anymore on a daily basis. Now we put AI into this. Now it's recognizing that, you know, I might be working on a, on a big project overnight tonight. And normally I would never drink coffee at 6 p.m. But because it knew that, it's gonna start brewing me a cup of coffee. It's, it's anticipating my needs. And that's sort of the future here, right? Because we talked about the washing machine or the fridge you know, all connected to the car, right? You're driving home in your car, your fridge senses that you're out of milk, right? And you didn't realize that, and it sends a note to your car and pops up a screen that says, hey, you need milk, we're now going to route you to your grocery store, and guess what? We already put in an order for you, confirmed, right? Or whatever, and you say, okay, and you park your car and they put a gallon of milk in your car and you drive home. Five minute detour, but guess what? It's saved yeah. you countless amounts of time. So when we talk about yeah. you know the technology being accessible for all people, what we're really trying to do here is to give people the one thing that they cannot buy, time. Yeah, that's really dope, Nick. Like you know, you talked a little bit earlier about um, about the global organization. I got two more questions, and I'm gonna get you <laughs> up out of here. I promise. So, so, so the first thing is though, before I get to talking about like global and culture and lived experience. Um, what I do want to talk about is AI. I mean, I'd be remiss if we didn't we didn't bring yeah. it up. It's interesting, like living corporate, like we're having all these conversations with the current clients, prospective clients, and everyone's trying to figure out the role that AI plays. When we tell them that hey, we we leverage AI to build some of our products, they get really excited. AI is on the tip and top of everyone's mind. It kind of and, and tongue. It kind of reminds me of back in like the like the 2010s when everyone was really excited about big data so we, every, everything was called big data big data big data and so i think like we're, we're in a similar situation where everything's being called ai some of these things are not necessarily artificial intelligence some of it might be prompting some of it might be conditional formatting even <laughs> so like so my question is like what what gar how far do you believe we can go when it comes with ai and the internet of things like, and where do you think we still need to raise some reasonable eyebrows and put some guardrails up before we just go full tilt, steam ahead? Yeah, so to talk about that, I think we need to understand that AI isn't new. AI has been around for a long time. It's just slowly developing, right? To the point where today, like I said earlier, it is now accessible to the consumer, 
right? Prior to that, it wasn't accessible to consumer. And then now that we have generative AI where we can prompt things and it helps you, you know, predict your text and helps you write messages and all these things. Well, what it's really doing is, again, trying to save me just a little bit of time. Uh, and and yeah. when we're talking about big data, well, what happened when there was big data revolution, we started collecting all this data. Well, what do we do with all this data? Well, we don't really know, right? Because there's just so much data being collected off of every single device that we have. We, we just have an infinite amount of data right now. This is where AI is going to start becoming really, really fun. We give this data to AI, and then what AI is really good at is looking for patterns, right? And trying to figure out what is happening based on the data. And when it starts thinking about all these patterns and start understanding what people are doing, you know, whatever that device may be, whatever that data, you know, stack may be, what it's really doing is being able to start predicting, right? And start thinking about what is going to happen next and then anticipating that and then starting to help with that. And, and that's a lot of what we do as consultants, right? We anticipate yeah. these, these trends. We help our clients understand how these trends are going to change their life and then really help them develop several courses of action to maximize impact using those trends, right? And sometimes that's where, you know, we get jokingly calling ourselves fortune tellers and, you know, futurists and whatever we want to call it. It's really just about recognizing trends and, and, and getting the data to support that. So when we think about AI, right, that's really what's happening here it is, is giving AI the learning models to understand the data, helping us parse through that data, right? We have too much data, you know? What we need is actionable data. We need data that we can see right. and visualize and, and understand. You know, if I gave you, you know, a spreadsheet with 8,000 data points on it, you, you know, pertaining to people's direction of travel, that really means nothing right. to you, right? But if we give right. that data to AI, layer in additional models such as weather and, you know, consumer habits and whatnot, well, we start understanding yeah. where people are going without even knowing, without yeah. even tracking them all these multiple, you know, milliseconds of their day. We can start anticipating mm -hmm. where people are going. And that's kind of the fun of this, right? Because we're just barely scraping to it. Going back to, you know, generative AI where it's prompt technology, well, that's really fun too, right? Because that's one subset of AI. That's really what's going to change voice-activated commands because you and I, you know, have, have probably seen, you know, many demos of this and ultimately it becomes a huge problem, right? You're sitting in your room screaming, hey, computer, do this. No, do this. No, do this, right? Well, what, what's happening mm -hmm. is that is understanding your language but everyone has different accents, you know, have different ways of speaking, and that's hard, right? But when you put it to yeah. AI, you know, then it becomes easier because it's not really listening to you per se. It's understanding what you're asking and then doing it. You know, and that's a big difference between a human and a pure computer, right? Like you and me talking yeah. – and, and I may recognize something going on with your face or a cough, mm -hmm. and I will recognize that. And I'll say, oh, let me go get you a cup of water. Right? That's mm -hmm. what moms do. Moms are you know, recognizing that pattern because they know you. Right? Versus someone right. who just came in off the streets seeing you cough, they might not know that, oh, you, you, know, you might need a cup of water. Right? And that's where AI is. It's really recognizing that, anticipating it, and trying to think of something. But what it's doing is it's using old data to be able to yeah. inform that decision. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about the prospect of, of AI supporting like stronger longitudinal analysis, predictive analytics, things of that nature. My hope is, is that there continues to be a human interface with that and that we don't just blindly trust a machine and that we have some degree of governance. Yeah, we've seen um, enough science and, fiction movies to, to recognize the uh, right. I don't want to say dangers, but you know, the the you, you know the mistake of letting AI run wild almost you, we have right. to guardrail it and treat it as if it's a as an emerging technology we we have to treat it like it's a child right we have to give it guardrails we have to teach it right from wrong and over time it right. starts to develop itself and it starts to learn right. and it starts to make decisions for itself and then at some point it grows up just like a child right and then we have to trust it at yeah. that point 
but what is important is the foundation of it. And we're talking about the nation, you know, very, very early stages of this. We have to all do our part to develop it and make it, you know, smarter and teach it how to be, you know, doing things that are good for everyone. Now, there are different ways to explain what that means, but, you know, we do have to guardrail it a little bit and teach it, right? Because if we're working on, say, for instance, health uh, related AI, you know, and, and putting that into wearables, well, we can't take away doctors, right? Just because an AI says that you are, you know, experiencing this, we still need that expertise that a doctor can do um, for that, you know. But what it's doing is it's eliminating all that time wasted, right? And the doctor can make a very, yeah. very informed decision based on a very, very short interaction. And we're giving that doctor time back, you know. I mean, we've all sat in doctor's offices and waited, waited and waited. And then we're like, oh, it's it was only like a 30 minute visit but i waited three hours for that well guess what the doctor may have had some big problem earlier on that they had to go through a lot of data to understand and that caused their whole data back up versus if there was already an ai that understood it and gave it you know its recommendations that says this is the data that supports it the doctor just needs to verify it and says oh yeah yeah that's a good or if it's not you say no that's not it and then reteach it how to do it very similar to a doctor right. intern you know, relationship, right? You know, it's interesting, and I want to, I want to, I want to close here, right? So we've talked about Capgemini being this global organization, working with a variety of different people from different ethnic, ge uh, ge uh, ge geographic um, uh, backgrounds, uh, belief systems, all types of things. Like I think that's like one of the beautiful things about just working in a global organization mm -hmm. that there's there's different people. I'm curious for you, like, what do you think it means to like? be inclusive of and create an environment where all perspectives and experience can be supported. I would imagine, especially right, like in a space, in an emerging space, like internet of things, well, an internet of things, not emerging, emerging, but like, it's not, I don't know, it's not oil drilling. It's, it's, it, and it continues to evolve in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably more black, brown, younger talent, or even aspirational talent, like looking to come into this space, right? Like, Nick, we did not talk about this, right? But I believe, like, I don't believe that you're a white man. So, like, you sh you show up, <laughs> you show up in these spaces authentically as you as who you are. Like, what does it look like from your perspective to support other uh, other talent who may come from historically marginalized groups? I think what we need to understand is that Cap Gemini is very very focused on you know diversity and inclusion. Uh, I am the executive sponsor of our Asia Pact ERG, uh, which is dedicated to AAPI, you know, uh, advancement and, and enrichment. Uh, it's open to all, right? And so we collaborate with the other ERGs, for instance, like Black Voices or Women in Leadership, right? And mm -hmm. we have these intercultural exchanges, right, where we sort of understand each other. Uh, for instance, right now, uh, recently, we just had uh, Lunar New Year, which is being celebrated in a lot of different countries um, within Asia, as well as mm -hmm. those of us as part of that uh, cultural descent, but it also coincides with Black History Month, right? So we think about that. There's a lot of intersectionality here, right? Uh, and, and as we start thinking about, for instance, IoT and devices and all of that, we need to think about whether or not this device is like you said earlier accessible to the masses and i'm not just talking about mobility here i'm talking about cultural accessibility mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a lot of people that are um you know not very uh, appreciative of new technology uh, and sometimes it is culturally driven sometimes it is economically driven even right and that's why we want to work um, to make these things accessible to all. Sometimes it's not about building this next gen, you know, insane price device that is only accessible to a certain amount of people. What we want to do is bring that down uh, through volume, through, you know, innovation, um, so that it becomes a, a, a device that could be accessible to everyone. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about, um, you know, a lot here. Uh, at Cap Gemini is trying to you know help our clients being able to reach all their cons uh, customer base and expanding that customer base even, right? 
But sometimes mm-hmm. we take a device or a, a technology or an idea that was really geared towards one subset. And then we think, oh, well, how else can we take that and apply it to another subset of people? Uh, and then really expanding that pie and really making sure that everyone can have access to it. And there may be ways to use that technology that the client hasn't even thought of. And that's where, when we think about our multiculturalness of a company like Capgemini, right? Here in America, there's a lot of us, uh, but globally, there's even more of us, right? And if you think about the fact that we are a, you know, headquartered in a French company, but I'm here in North America, and I am of, you know, Chinese descent, and, you know, my parents are refugees uh, are from a war-torn country. Like, this is a, a, a huge you know, a story that we're not telling to people who just see me walk into a room and talk about, you know, developments in IoT and how AI can influence that, right? But what it's really being shaped is, by is my own personal upbringing, you know, and that's why I'm big on, you know, accessibility, right? Because if you think about, you know, we all have, you know, relatives that may be older. And for instance, like my parents are, are they love technology, but they're scared of it. And so for me, it's sure. trying to tell, you know, the, the engineers to say, hey, put yourself in the shoes of someone who's 60, 70 years old. How will they approach this? Yeah. Because you're missing that entire yeah. market, right? If you're only targeting 18 to 34, well, you know, right. you're missing the rest of the world. And, and maybe right. there is some sort of, you know, a way to make it more accessible to everyone, right? And, and that's where we – you know, as Capgemini and our multiculturalness and our diversity and all the different kinds of, you know, uh, groups that we have, we get together with our clients and we actually help enhance that. And that's something that we have to, you know, focus on and really, you know, work on understanding is that there's a lot of different people out there, but we all are one people, right? And we can all work together to advance this. And sometimes technology is that common thread that helps us all work together. I love that. And, you know, there's so much there around just it's so interesting. I know we're like we can, you know, and these these things, they 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 wane and they 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 wax and they wane. Right. But the reality is, is that like when you're inclusive and thinking about like all of a people, which is like humans, Mm -hmm. all of the human people, then it's still a capitalistic exercise. Like you're still like this is like it's it improves the bottom line. And. It improves your mark, improves your market share, improves your brand eminence. Who doesn't want as many customers as possible? And I mean, it's like, and then it's kind of like, well, dang, like if we having a conversation and you telling me you don't want more customers, <laughs> then like, uh, may, then you know what? We just, I'm not probably the partner for you because I want to help you reach as much of the market. We got this, we got the TAM. I want you to hit as much of this as you can. Right. Right. Like, like, what are we talking about? Like, and then like, and, and then to, to reject that, to reject the, to your point, like the, uh, the multicultural lens or just reality, not even lens, just reality is to, is to put, is to put a, a, a very low ceiling on your go to market. Right. And so, you know, I really appreciate that. Nick, look, this has been a fire conversation. We got to have you come back, man, talking to your point about you coming from, um, you, you you know, coming from a war, your parents come from a war-torn country. You being like you coming in and caring so much and representing so much, but that also being like the silent influence behind how you navigate and do what you do. Like that's super dope. Look, before we let you go, um, any parting words or shout-outs? You know, I, I'm very very grateful um, to to be a part of an organization like Capgemini where we're able to touch so many different lives um, through our work. Uh, And I think that as a company of a lot of individuals, right, we're all able to bring our own unique perspective to that. And that's where we really, really help our clients is, is bringing that individual unique perspective to a problem, but using the power of the global organization and to end to end capabilities of all of that to really create a very, very unique and custom solution for whatever problem a client might have. And that's something that I have not been able to um, find elsewhere. And that's why I really stay here. And I think that one of the, you know, one of the things here is that we have a really good core group of leaders that are enabling this. And I think that's really, it, it starts from the top down. 
and and uh you know thinking of back to all the things that we've talked about here today yeah you know it's great to drive and push you know the boundaries of technology but i think we just last touched on it is that how does it help an individual whoever that individual is they're all different we're all different people we all come from different backgrounds different upbringing but how does that technology impact my life and that's something that we help our clients understand to create that personal connection nick man i mean look you, you dropped the mic i can't i can't add nothing to that dog i appreciate you thank you for being thank uh, you. being a guest here and uh we'll talk to you soon thank you so much peace <laughs> All right, y'all, that does it for us today at Living Corporate. Thank you so much for checking out the pod. Make sure you click the link in the show notes to learn more about Capgemini and all the incredible work they're doing all around the world. Very excited. See y'all next time. Till then, peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.